Welcome back. You know, in my first couple of series on telescopes, I explained, uh, first of all, practical selection, how to select a good uh, rifle scope. And uh, in the second series, I, the second video, I spoke about uh, what objective lenses are, adjustable objectives, and that sort of thing. Uh, today I'm going to talk about something which I was not originally inclined to do. Um, I have been asked more frequently now uh, about first versus second focal plane telescopes. Uh, it was really not a it was really not a popular uh, matter of discussion until apparently very recently, and it has much to do with going back. If I can go back to my first video, uh, it has much to do with uh, the notion that uh, more expensive means better, uh, and in the world of rifle scopes, that may or may not be true. Um, so let's let's talk about uh, first of all the difference between a first and a second focal plane telescope. Um, I'll go over a whole host of issues. First of all, how does a second focal uh, plane scope work? Uh, and, and who uses them, and why, uh, and what's their advantage, if there is any? And how does a first focal plane scope work? Who uses them? why and if there is any advantage, what is it? Um, let me explain, uh, first of all, what that means in terms of the physical placement. What is, what is a first versus second? Well, the focal planes, I'm just going to use an old uh, muzzle-loading scope here, just for illustration purposes. I mean, I, the architecture of uh, all scopes, regardless of their price uh, and the quality of lenses, is essentially the same. Uh, you have an ocular lens, ocular meaning, you know, your, your eye, that's the end your eye looks into, uh, and the objective end being the objective, the objective being the target. Uh, telescopes, modern telescopes have some sort of an erector uh, in, the, in the middle, which uh, an elevation and windage uh, adjustment turrets. Uh, and in the old days they didn't, sometimes the adjustments were on the bases themselves. Um, but the, uh, and, and you have naturally uh, the variable focal uh, fo focusing ring if your scope is a variable. Now, first focal plane, the focal plane meaning the visual plane, every, you know, uh, if, if we look at something, uh, where our eye lands is a focal plane. Uh, whether it's right now I'm looking at the telescope, so my focal plane is about nine inches away. If I'm looking at the wall across the room, uh, my focal plane is about 15 feet away. So the focal plane is wherever you, uh, wherever your uh, lines of convergence, where your, where your, the lens inside your own eye, where the lines of convergence come together and focus on a particular object, uh, however f close or how distant. So the first focal plane on a uh, rifle scope is in the is in the uh, first uh, section of the lens. In other words, forward towards the objective. The second focal plane would be more towards uh, the rear. Um, now, I'll show you a, uh, and it can be it can be situated in various positions depending on uh, the arc the interior architecture of the scope. Um, you can see right here, here's the ocular assembly and the inside of what the inside of a scope looks like essentially. And it can, as I say, it can vary. So the crosshair, uh, that is the uh, reticle, uh, resides in the same place as the, uh, the first focal plane. And that means that the, uh, that means that the, um, there are two focal planes. There's one on the rear and there's one on the front. So the first focal plane actually resides right exactly at the uh, reticle. Now, the app, the in the second focal plane, the second focal plane, uh, the the reticle resides uh, apart from. Sometimes it's just connected by w wires. You know, believe it or not, uh, one of the one of the principal uh, components of uh, reticles in the past used to be uh, spider uh, threads. Spider threads are very strong, they're stronger than steel, so in order to get a very fine uh, crosshair, 
Uh, the finest target crosshairs are still sometimes made of uh, spider uh, threads. Um, now, there is a picture reversal assembly. Now, if you, if you had a telescope uh, that didn't have this picture reversal assembly, when you looked at a distant deer, the deer would be standing upside down. So that's the reason for that. The, these lenses actually flip the picture back over. And that's what you have in any uh, binoculars as well. All right, so you understand where the first focal plane resides and where the second focal plane resides. And let's explain uh, what that does. If you, if you look through a second focal plane telescope, you're looking through 99.9% .9 of all the telescopes made. Uh, standard uh, telescopes that have been made, uh, really since they've been mounting them on rifles, have been made with second focal plane. Uh, when you look at a deer with a variable scope in close, uh, you want to have uh, you want to have what appears to be a rather bold cross here, especially if you're in the woods with a cluttered background. This this shows you uh, this this would be typical for uh, the type of hunting that we do here in New England. When you see a deer uh, 15 or 20 or 30 yards away, this is what he's going to look like. He's going to be uh, he's going to be in a cluttered uh, in a cluttered field. Uh, he's going to be very well camouflaged. And the last thing you want to have is uh, crosshairs that don't uh, show up uh, with, with immediate appearance. You, you want to be sure that the crosshairs are bold against your target. And as you can see here, they are. Um, and this is, this, is, this is what you get with a standard uh, second focal plane scope. You get a very bold crosshair in, cro in close, and that crosshair uh, is easy to define in a cluttered setting. As you wind the, uh, the power up, as it becomes more powerful, now the crosshair tends to shrink in size and become apparently more precise. And it does become more precise. Because the crosshair, as the target increases in size, the crosshair subtends to a smaller amount. In other words, takes up less uh, space on the target. I'll give you a very nice uh, example. Uh, for instance, if you're if you're uh, sighting in your rifle, say you've got a uh, say you've got a, uh, a a four to fourteen scope that you use on your varmint rifle. So uh, you know you 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 want to sight it in. But when you go to sight it in, you turn the you turn the uh, uh, variable selector all the way up, and you're sighting in on a target which only has a a, a bullseye. Uh, perhaps uh, an inch in diameter uh, on one of those on one of those uh, sighting targets. You have minute of angle squares all over it, and your 14 power scope can easily see those those minute of angle squares, and can also see the small sighter targets that you can zero in on. Now, if you're using the four power, the four power the the crosshairs cover uh, much of the target. In fact, it may even cover much of the paper itself. But when you wind it up to 14 power, now your crosshair shrinks in size and the target comes in and you can place the crosshair directly, exactly in the middle of the little circle uh, on that orange square on your uh, sight in target. So they become more precise as you dial it in. So uh, as, the, as the game is farther away, uh, the crosshair also becomes more precise. And it's especially nice if you're, if you're shooting varmints, for instance, uh, woodchucks, prairie dogs and things like that, distant mice, if you like to, now some people like to go out shooting mosquitoes, so at 300 yards, so if you like to shoot mosquitoes at 300 yards, you really want to have a precise crosshair. So that's exactly what you want. You want to have, you want to have a crosshair that becomes finer as the distance becomes greater and as the power becomes greater. That's, that's essential. Now, first focal plane reticles. Um, and I think there's a, let me go, let me go back a little bit. Um, I think, I think what happens in, in uh, our culture is it's easy to, it's easy to discern that first means best, like first place. No, it, it doesn't mean it that way. First or second doesn't mean first is best and second is second best. First only means the placement, the position of uh, the uh, reticle on the, uh, as far as where the, the focal plane is. And also, because uh, first focal plane scopes 
are more costly to manufacture, many times more costly. Uh, a comparable first focal plane uh, scope can cost four to five times more uh, than a, uh, a second focal plane scope of the same quality. And that's because of the engineering that's required in order to, in order to make that possible. So you're paying, you're paying an extreme amount simply for engineering. It does not equate to being better. Uh, you know, more is not more is not necessarily better. Now, with let's show you some let's show you some different reticles that I pulled up off the web here. This is this is uh, they're not they're not that easy to uh, to uh, pick out. Uh, but this is this is the standard uh, loophole system of uh, reticles. As you can see right here, uh, this is this is the standard duplex uh, reticle. It's, it's as I showed you with the picture on the deer. And you get your fine duplex reticle which is preferred uh, by you know many many people who are varmint shooters and things like that or target shooters. A lot of target shooters prefer uh, just a, a fine crosshair. And we'll get into that. Uh, you have you have sometimes you have a tapering uh, crosshair. I used to love tapered crosshairs. Tapered crosshairs are easy to pick up under all circumstances and they fade right to the center of the target. Uh, the, then you have a loophole dot, you've got target dots. Most of these things are all, most of these things are all um, proprietary names anyways. Uh, and here's your, here's your standard crosshair which was, uh, that was favored for many years before they invented the uh, duplex reticle. Now, as you get down into uh, as you get down into the uh, reticles that are most often used for second, uh, I mean for first focal planes, now you have now you have various uh, now you have various range finding uh, dots, hash marks, uh, all sorts of systems which are you know calibrated uh, for particular uh, purposes. So that brings up. That brings up the, the primary purpose of a first focal plane reticle. A first focal plane reticle is situated such that uh, as you turn the volume up on your scope, you turn that power up, as you turn the power up, the crosshair grows proportionally with it. Um, so if a, a, a crosshair which subtends to one inch or say a half inch at, I'll, I'll use one inch to keep the math simple, but if, if you have a cross here that subtends to one inch at 100 yards, at 200 yards it subtends to two inches, and 300 yards it subtends to three inches. And think about what that does, for instance, on a prairie dog, which is only yay high and, and that, that big. You're talking about an animal which is smaller than an average woman's shoebox. Well, if you have a if you have a cross here that keeps on growing, and you're trying to hit wood, uh, woodchucks and prairie dogs with your with your high with your high power uh, 220 swift or something like that, and you're trying to get way out to uh, 400 500 yards to take pot shots at, at uh, prairie dogs, you can very easily obscure so much of the prairie dog that you can't really see where he is, uh, and you can't you can't spot your shots that well through the scope. Now that that presents a real issue for anybody who is a uh, long distance target shooter as well because the person who's for instance the bench rest shooter who likes to be able to shoot uh, at 300 yards or 200 yards he wants to get that crosshair right precisely he wants to be able to bisect not the target but he wants to be able to bisect the previous bullet hole so he can see what he's doing uh, he wants to be able to take a 22 caliber bullet hole and divide it into a pie shape so that's what a, that, that's what a second focal plane scope excels at. A first focal plane scope is miserable at that. A first focal plane scope's uh, entire purpose, the only reason it exists, is to be able to use it as a range finder. Well this brings us back to the first video that I did on, on uh, selecting scopes. Um, if, you're, if you're the hunter, uh, you know, I, I did my army thing uh, you know, and I did my police thing. I'm not sniping anymore. Uh, I have no intention to go out and buy a sniper rifle and buying a, you know, all the all the regalia that goes with it. I have, I'm 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 going to be living the rest of my life situated comfortably in the hills of New Hampshire. And if anybody comes to the house that shouldn't be here, any hunting rifle I have or any gun I have will do just fine. Thank you very much. But I'm not intending to take up 
Uh, I'm not intending to put on camouflage clothes and face paint and all that anymore and go out into the woods. Uh, you know, I, I've got a I've got a beer gut now and I've got a nice TV and that's where that's where I'm at. Um, but if if you're inclined if you're inclined to be uh, shooting at you know a thousand yards if that's your game if you want to shoot at a thousand yards, um, do you know MOA scopes will shoot a thousand yards just as nicely as a mill dot scope. And let, let me explain why. A what first of all, what is what is mill dot? Is it military dot? Uh, no, that's not what mill dot means. You know, you get mill spec, so people think that mill spec and mill dot, military specification, mill dot it means military dot it had nothing to do with it whatsoever. Mill means as in thousand. So uh, and it's a, and it's a be, being a dot or a hash mark or whatever. It's it's technically the the mill dot is only one type of a mill radian type scope. A mill radian scope, uh, a mill radian reticle, is one that subtends to a constant of a thousand uh, to the to the ratio of 1,000. If you take this is this is a this is a we'll call this a radian, all right. You know, in 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 a circle, uh, you have the radius of a circle, and that is called a chord, all right. Now that radius, that 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 radius right there, that that chord, uh, and then you you place another chord, and that becomes that becomes. Uh, the amount that it subtends to, and in the case of a mill radian scope, it means that it subtends to one uh, one mill radian, which is one thousandth of a part. That means that if you have a if you have a uh, scope that looks at a hundred inches, I should say a thousand inches, the target will be one inch high. If you're looking at a target which is a thousand feet. The target will be one foot high. If it's a thousand yards, it'll be one yard high or wide. And if you're looking at a thousand miles, then the the amount that it subtends will be one mile high. You have to know you have to know the either the height of the height of your target or the width of your target, uh, or you have to know the range of your target. If you if you lack either one of them, it doesn't work. So, for instance, uh, a, a mill, a mill radian, uh, a mill rad telescope, uh, you know, using constants of say the, the silhouette size of uh, of a human being, which is the way the military uh, would delineate it uh, on a silhouette target, they use they use that constant uh, in order to measure distance. So, when the crosshair, when the when the crosshair is put out there and the the hash marks fall. Uh, within a certain within a certain subtension, they know exactly how far uh, the target is, and they can basically compute the trajectory. Now we're talking again, going back to my first video. We're talking in rather uh, obtuse terms for a hunter because we're talking in terms of ranges which are far in excess of what an ethical shot should be on any big game animal. I'll stand on this as long as I live. That big game animals are too valuable. And too precious to be taking pot shots at them uh, that can that can drift with the wind that can occur at, at extreme ranges and you know when you're when you're in the kind of country where uh, such game is found, wind is ferocious after the sun comes up the The wind can become gusty and it can be very constant throughout the day uh, it's very easy for for a shot to be blown off course and and the wind does not blow at a constant direction either because of all the because of all the nuances of, of the terrain, the plains are nothing but they're not flat. The, the plains have a lot of uh, hills and, and, and uh, valleys, and uh, they create all kinds of swirling wind, wind currents. So what it might be blowing directly into your face where you are, uh, it could be blowing at 90 degrees full value, uh, you know, 300 yards away that you don't see, uh, or it could, the, the bullet could literally be going through different courses of uh, wind en route to the target. Wind is not always easy to discern, especially when you're, you know, you're all excited, you've got a, 
you've got a, a big elk out there or a mule deer that's staring at you, uh, you know, you're not paying attention to wind. And so what you're doing is you're settling down and you're trying to, you're trying to get your shot off. And uh, it's very easy for a, for a bullet to veer off and to, and to strike him in his uh, intestines and, and lose a nice game animal that uh, will be eaten by, uh, by coyotes later. So again, you know, if we're talking about hunting ranges, you don't need to have range finders and you don't need to have all these different things that manufacturers have come up with to spend your money for you. And you don't need to get excited about uh, what, what kind of dots to have and all that stuff and how to figure out uh, your multiples of your range. That's absolutely not necessary. Uh, you only need to have, as I, as I showed you in the first video, and if, if you haven't watched the first video, please do because this is really, you know, this, this, is, this is based on that. But your trajectory will take care of if your if your gun is sighted in correctly uh, for the for the rifle that you're shooting, whether it's a 306, a 308, a 270, uh, you know 6.5 uh, 6.5 Swede, uh, 280 Remington. No matter what it is, if you're if you're sighted in with the trajectory which favors that cartridge throughout its mid height trajectory uh, for the size game that you're hunting, uh, you don't need to be in the least bit concerned with range out to 400 yards. And that's, you know, it, well, and that also depends on the cartridge that you're using. You don't take a 308 if you're going out to 400 yards uh, on game. You take, you take a 270, you take a, a 306 with the appropriate bullet. Uh, you know, you, you have to size the cartridge to uh, the game and the conditions that you're hunting. I'll just, I'll just talk briefly about that um, because I do get a lot of, I do get a lot of questions about uh, this sort of thing, and people people are asking, you know, they're they're setting up. They know they tell me they're setting up for a hunting rifle, and they want to get a they want to get a long range. They say they want to get a long range, 308, so that they can shoot through, you know a thousand yards with it. And I and I have to and I have to settle them down a little bit and say, well, first of all, if you're looking to shoot a thousand yards, please don't do it on a live animal. Uh, do it on a you know on a live big game animal. Do it on a do it on a prairie dog or a woodchuck. You're either going to hit them or you're going to miss them. So you, there's no there's no uh, there's no loss involved. Um, but if you're going to be if you're going to be shooting at that range, the 308 is not the way to go. Uh, it's it's fine for the it's fine for the military sniper who has his mill dot reticle and he's sitting there with his with his spotter who's got his who's got his calculator and he's plugging in all the numbers and they sit there for five minutes you know, calculating their range, but that's not the way hunting goes. Hunting is, you know, it's, it's an outdoor activity. It's more akin to hiking uh, and, and all the other things. You know, you, 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 you're involved. Uh, you don't have any time to be sitting around with calculators and things like that. It could be snowing, raining, or all the other things. So if you're, if, if you're whatever you're gearing up to hunt, you know, if you're, if you're gearing up to hunt, out to 350 yards, and that's and remember, it has to be within your shooting capability. If you're not, if you're not capable of hitting uh, your targets at whatever position you are given uh, the opportunity that you're given at that time for a shot, then you really have to hike in a little bit closer. You know, that's that's the thrill of hunting. Sometimes I think the the thrill of hunting seems to be lost amid amid all the uh, technology. Hunting is hunting. It's not shooting. It's not called shooting. It's called hunting. And hunting means, you know, getting sometimes in a low crawl position, taking your backpack off, leaving your spotting scope behind, and, and low crawling for a half hour uh, to, the top of a, to the top of a knoll so that the uh, antelope, the prong, pronghorn antelope doesn't see you. And, you know, sometimes when you get to the top of the hill, you're not even there anymore. But that's the excitement of the hunt. Or maybe he's moved off to the next knoll, and you've got to work your way around, and you've got to you've got to somehow intersect him, and, and you know head him off at the pass. And those are things that make hunting fun. But don't turn it into a, don't turn it into a target shooting sport because it never was. You know, hunting is not a target shooting sport, and you you know to to uh, bastardize it like that to 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 think that you basically uh, can do all these things that the uh, catalogs want you to think that you can do that you can somehow sit off. Sit off in the distance, and you know, like a like a military sniper, uh, take up a position, and uh, you know, sight in on uh, a big game animal. That's about the silliest nonsense that there is, because big game animals appear where big game animals appear. 
you you can't you can't set up the circumstances. Um, the that's not the way hunting goes. So anyway, if if you're uh, you know if you're interested in if you're interested in the type of shooting that uh, that favors uh, you know range finding reticles, you're really you're really going beyond uh, the scope of hunting uh, and not to use a pun, but the scope of hunting it has nothing to do with uh, mill rad scopes and it has nothing to do with uh, first focal plane uh, reticles. It has to do with being able to use a uh, sighting reticle that places a crosshair on your game animal quickly, efficiently, and visibly in a hurry without obscuring it and without, and without making it uh, difficult. You don't want to have you know, you don't want to have dots all the way down your scope, which obscures the, the game animal that you're trying to see. You don't use scopes uh, for sighting game. That's, you, use, you use your binoculars to sight game, to pick it out. Uh, you use uh, spotting scopes to, uh, to study uh, antlers to see how big they are. I'll tell you this, that when you get out to 300 yards, uh, you can't really tell how big uh, an the antlers are on a huge, antl uh, on a huge uh, elk. Uh, it's very difficult because the, the, the heavy beams at the bottom fade as they, they get la larger, and the very uh, elk that you might think is a terrific, uh, a terrific head of game, uh, you know, your guide or your partner, your buddy might say, and that's not the one, you know, I, I, I'm looking through the spotting scope and that, that thing stinks, uh, you know, because what looks, what looks good to you uh, through, your, through your rifle telescope, even if you've got a 10 power rifle telescope, what looks good through that doesn't look so good with a 24 power uh, spotting scope. So, you know, don't use your, don't, don't use your rifle telescope uh, as a sighting instrument. That's an expedient which is used in the military for military style shooting. That's, a, that's an expedient which is used in police work for, act, to be very honest with you, we never, we never even consider such a thing in police work because there's, nobody's going to be shooting, no, no counter police sniper is going to be shooting at anything much beyond the, the width of a street and the width of a street in most cities is 33 feet from curbstone to curbstone. So you're really, you're, you're extreme close range. Um, mill rad stuff, that's all, that, that, that all sounds very sexy uh, to the tune of about $2,500 for a, such a scope and you don't need it. There's, there's no, there's no uh, reason whatsoever on God's green earth that you need to have uh, a, a first focal plane scope. Uh, let me explain also too, oftentimes people think that a mill rad scope, a, a, a mill dot scope is more precise. Um, that's not true either. Let me, let me explain why. If you have, if you have a MOA scope, MOA means minute of angle. Minute of angle uh, is, is one sixtieth, just like on a clock. If you take, if you take, if you take a full clock, you got sixty minutes. Well, if you take if you take uh, if you take a compass dial, you got 360 degrees. Each degree is further separated into 60 minutes. So, one MOA describes one two. Uh, listen to this. Listen to this ratio. One out of 21,600th of a full circle. So you take a full circle and you divide it into 21,600 small little pieces, if you can do that. I don't think, if you took this, if you took this circle right here, uh, you wouldn't, I, I doubt that you could find a, a pencil sharp and fine enough to, to mark that many placements on that circle. Then, if you remember that most hunting telescopes go down to uh, a quarter of a minute of angle, in other words each click is a quarter of a minute, then you multiply that and that comes out to 86,400 parts. So that's a very very fine and extremely precise measurement of, uh, of, of, of uh, degree. Um, and some target scopes further refine that down to uh, eighths. So in other words 
uh, eight parts of a minute. So that would be 172,800, 172,800 parts of a circle. So that's 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 extremely fine measurement that you won't find with a uh, mill rad scope. A, a mill rad scope with increments of uh, one tenth mils has a precision of one ten thousandths of a circle. So you see, it's a very um, it, it's a very different sort of measurement, and and the, it's it's not based on precision. It's based on measurement. It's, it's a system which is based on a standard of a thousand, so that that standard is easy. You know, you can compute that very easily. You know, if if a uh, if a target is uh, one foot if if a target is one foot tall, that is if you know you're, you're looking at you're looking at a soldier which is half of his torso high to the top of his head. You got roughly a foot. So you know you can compute a thousand feet or whatever whatever means that you can use to uh, to calculate them. So that's the only that's the only reason why uh, why first focal plane scopes exist. So I hope that clears up some of uh, the confusion about it. And you know if if you and they don't you know first focal plane telescopes. Let me say this again: first focal plane telescopes have nothing to do with greater quality. They're, they always pour all the quality into them because when you start spending $2,500 or more for a scope, uh, you know, people want to have the very finest glass and that's what they give you. They'll give you the very finest glass, but on the same hand, you could get the same quality glass uh, in, in the same brand scope uh, for, for much, much less money, for, for a fourth or fifth of that uh, cost, for five or $600 and you still get the same thing. One other thing that's one other thing that becomes uh, a curious uh, thing with with this with this industry is that you know right now we've right now we're flood the market is flooded with thirty millimeter and even we're even getting bigger uh, tube sizes on scopes. You know the the average the average scope uh, I should say most scopes uh, most scopes in the world uh, until a few years ago uh, were all one inch tubes. And that was a that was a bonus when they went up from three quarters of an inch back in the uh, post post World War II era. Uh, you know, 22 scopes in those days had half inch tubes, and a lot of a lot of uh, high power rifle scopes had three quarter inch tubes. So when scope tubes became one inch, uh, that was considered to be extremely uh, strong, uh, more than more than sufficiently strong to stand the rigors of any hunting trip. You know whether and 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 very frequently a gun would fall out of a tree or, or down a cliff or something. The stock would break, but the scope would stay intact. That was that was the desire of the scope industry back in the uh, back in the uh, late '60s and early '70s. People were complaining that scopes were you know they they looked fragile because they got glass and all this other stuff, and they said nah, I'm not going to buy any scope because it's gonna it's gonna flunk out on me. Um, it's, it, they're not going to flunk out. Uh, your telescope, your telescope with a one-inch tube is extremely strong. Military requirements, you know, these are people who are, you know, they're they're running around with tanks and uh, you know heavy artillery that uh, that that we don't use normally in in this part of New Hampshire and and uh, most of the states in the 48. Um, you know, you you don't you don't need to have you don't need to have extreme ruggedness that a 30 millimeter tube will give you. Does it provide additional? Uh, does it provide additional uh, focal value? Absolutely not. Does it provide additional light gathering ability? It does, but your eye can't perceive it because your eye, our, the average exit pupil of our eye, the amount of light that our eye can absorb is basically five millimeters in diameter. It ranges from about two millimeters at the low to maybe, uh, if you really have great eyes, it, it can go up to as much as nine millimeters at the top. But your eye can only absorb so much light to begin with, and even if it's absorbing only half of the maximum amount, you still have got uh, you still have got more than sufficient light to discern your target and and extreme clarity of detail, uh, resolution that is. So there's there's nothing to be gained uh, in terms of light gathering ability for a larger tube. So that's it. I hope that that clarified some issues, and I hope that you shoot well. God bless.